So good morning, everyone, again. What I want to do today <coughs> is uh, basically repeat a few things that we did um, <coughs> the last time uh, concerning the uh, hysteresis, because it turns out that <coughs> Hysteresis is eventually going to be more and more important. There are people working on hysteresis. There are um, we're, we're trying to understand what the hysteresis is. And as I said, we're also trying to um, find ways of living with hysteresis if you can't get rid of it. So uh, just and um, there was this animation slide that I had that I would also like to go through, but just to remind you with a few words of what we had gone through, basically. Okay. As you may remember, we took two <coughs> um, prototype systems, one having a large hysteresis and one having showing a, a rather narrow hysteresis. I mean, large hysteresis means about, um, in this case, it's about 27 Kelvin, and in the other case, it's about 8 Kelvin. <coughs> and um, we tried going through the hysteresis under certain conditions. And as you may recall, in this narrow hysteresis case, um, if we <coughs> sort of uh, move around in the temperature, if we, if we just uh, me measure completely from the lowest temperatures up to, the, up to high temperatures and back, we have the full hysteresis, of course. Now, when we go inside the loop, what happened? Um, we can stop, give a pause at any temperature we want, and then decrease the temperature, and then we can get these loops sort of thing. Now, why do we get the loops in some cases, and why don't we get the loops? That was the important thing, okay? So here, as you can see, we come up to a certain temperature, we go back and forth, but what happens is that when we go up in temperature, we're changing the state from martensite to austenite, yeah? So, we have all the way down here 100% martensite and up here 100% austenite. So when we're going through the hysteresis, we're going through some uh, quantity of martensite to some quantity of austenite. So we start here for, with 100% martensite and when we go up here, let's say, okay, we have a little bit of austenite, whatever, but um, it turns out that when we decrease the temperature and increase the temperature, that we cannot change the state of the system. So there is this, there's this one particular thing about hysteresis, is that when you're going through loops, or when you're going back and forth in the temperature, there are two cases. One is you don't change the state of the system. Two, you change the state of the system. Okay, the two basic things, which is important for the uh, magnetocaloric effects. So here what has happened is that, since everything is going back and forth on the same curve, that means we've put the state, we've put the system into a certain state that has a lot of martensite and a little bit of, uh, of austenite, perhaps, and then it gets stuck there, and it will not, the state of the system will not change until we increase the temperature further. So we increase the temperature further, and then we come to a point where we say, let's say, let's look at this loop over here. Now, we come up here, we start decreasing the temperature, and this goes down. If we were to go back up in the temperature, this would have followed perhaps a curve that would be something like this here. But as we go down in the temperature, and if we cross the martensite transition temperature at any point, this is the MS temperature somewhere around here, if we cross it, then it is possible to change the state of the system again. Okay? So we're decreasing. We're changing the state of the system. Anytime you're changing the state of the system, you're causing an entropy change as well. Okay. And uh, so, and then we go back up again. In fact, here in this loop over here, which you see this, uh, with the small symbols, uh, that uh, if you really cross it, then you practically come on the reverse transformation branch, but I mean, on the forward transformation branch. But um, you never really do. But you see here, you are changing the state of the system because you've gone down below MS, and then you stop here, and then you go. There's a pause over here where nothing seems to happen until you merge with the uh, reverse transformation branch again. And when you're on the reverse transformation branch, then everything changes again. So, and then, um, 
this is the case where we have uh, the possibility to move around in the loop. If we broaden the hysteresis, yeah, too fast. Okay. If we broaden the hysteresis, we see that when we're going down and we pause and try to increase the temperature again, um, nothing happens. The system gets locked in a certain state. And then when we come back to the branch, then the state can change. Likewise on increasing, if we go up, you see here, it's better seen here than in here. This is the MS temperature, almost. So since we have not gone below the MS temperature, when we re-reduce the temperature here, uh, this gets stuck in a uh, particular state. Okay, is this clear now? Yeah? Okay. So, and then what do we do? We measure the adiabatic temperature change. Now the problem with these figures are that um, this is an isothermal process, okay? So we're measuring at each temperature, we're going up and down. Now we're me when we're measuring the adiabatic temperature change, uh, that's an adiabatic process. And it's not so easy to understand an adiabatic picture in terms of a isothermal picture when you're looking at it, okay? So then we're gonna to come to the entropy change later on. But um, this was the, uh, the temperature change we had, and I told you about the first shot and the, sec and, and the uh, subsequent shots. So initially, you have, uh, when you measure the, temperature, uh, the adiabatic temperature change, you have a strong change in the temperature, okay? Let's say, um, I'm not sure if this is exactly the same sample that we have over here. We're here at 250. Yeah, yes, we, it is the same sample. So this is about, our starting temperature is about 251.2 or something, and that would be somewhere around here. So it's just um, somewhere close to the loop. So um, we apply a magnetic field um, uh, from zero to five Tesla and the system cools it gets, um, it's, it, it's in the uh, uh, hysteresis, of course, and then when you, um, when you remove the field and subsequently apply the field again, then your increase and decrease in temperature is no longer 1.4, but it's, uh, it's just about a half of that. And we said that, okay, um, this is a way to live with hysteresis we can live with 0 0.7 Kelvin instead of 1.4 Kelvin. Of course, technically, this doesn't mean very much, but it tells you that if you have systems where you have larger temperature changes, and you do in various compounds that have a hysteresis, the initial shot is, let's say, about 5 Kelvin, and the subsequent shots are about 2.5 or 3 Kelvin, and that you can live with. Yeah? Um, so, um, <clears throat> So, and then uh, um, we looked at this, and we said that, yes, the initial shot here is 2.5 Kelvin. It was 1.4 Kelvin here. And then uh, we get so stuck in the uh, hysteresis loops that uh, nothing happens, okay? There are no further subsequent shots. Now, what did we say? We said you either change the state of the system or you don't change the state of the system. If you're changing the state of the system, you have the magneto calorie effect. You have the entropy change. Uh, this can be the inverse magneto calorie effect or likewise the conventional magneto calorie effect. It doesn't matter, okay? <clears throat> um, but if you're not changing the state of the system, you are in one single state. In all cases, you would have a conventional magneto calorie effect. I mean, a very, very, very small one compared to what you should have. Um, but if you're not changing the state of the system, uh, then you're not changing much of the entropy, okay? You're only changing maybe a little bit the magnetic entropy, uh, things like that. But you're not, you're not giving rise to any structural transformation in the case when you have a hysteresis in magnetostructural transitions. So then we went on, and I tried to show you the... Uh, um, uh, the entropy 
as a function of temperature and how that looks like schematically in the case of a magnetostructural transition, a first order transition with hysteresis. Now, um, like I said, when we look at the temperature dependence of the magnetization and a, and a, temp and a hysteresis in the temperature, and then we try to understand that in terms of, uh, uh, we try to under understand um, temp uh, adiabatic processes in terms of isothermal processes, it, uh, it becomes uh, tricky. So uh, the way to study an adiabatic process like the adiabatic temperature change is to look at the entropy, because the, the entropy, an adiabatic process, the entropy, what happens to the entropy? The entropy is always constant, isn't it? So if you're at a value here, um, when you apply magnetic fields and remove magnetic fields, you're always on a constant, constant entropy line, so you know where you are. So now, um, uh, we have Two cases, one in an applied magnetic field, one in a zero magnetic field, and another two cases of the conventional and the inverse magnetocaloric effects. So in the conventional magnetocaloric effect, what do you have? You have a transition from a low temperature, high magnetization, let's say a ferromagnetic state, to a high temperature paramagnetic state. Um, so that um, when you apply a magnetic field, what is going to happen? The magnetic field is going to select the state of higher temperature, it's going to stabilize the state of higher, higher magnetization. It's going to s stabilize the state of higher magnetization further so that the transition temperature is going to shift to higher temperatures, okay? So for the H equals zero curve, we have this blue curve over here with the hysteresis. So this is, uh, if you go down in temperature, this is the uh, forward transformation path and this is here the reverse transformation path. If we apply a magnetic field, the transition temperature is going to shift, and we know that the um, entropy should go down, okay? If this is the paramagnetic state over here and we've applied a magnetic field, well, we've made things a little bit more orderly so that the entropy will go down up here. Likewise, when we're here in the martensite state, if the martensite state is lightly magnetic or or ferromagnetic, likewise over there, the entropy will go down again in the pure martensite state because it's just a pure state. So the whole curve shifts downwards. And now what happens if I initially sit at this temperature and apply a magnetic field, then this is going to take me to uh, a point on the curve where I have uh, applied the magnetic field. So. Since this is all happening at constant entropy, the temperature can change only horizontally here, not in any other fashion. I cannot change the entropy. The total entropy change is zero. So it goes from this point to this point. So the conventional magnetocaloric effect tells us that the um, system will warm when you apply a magnetic field. Now, in the case of the inverse magnetocaloric effect, what do we have? We have the H equals zero curve here. This is also the blue curve. And then we have the uh, curve which corresponds to the higher field. Now, at high temperatures and at low temperatures, far away from the transition, as here, the entropy has to go down, okay? Because those are just single state uh, systems. You're either in the pure austenite state or you're in the pure martensite state. But what do we observe? We observe uh, a, uh, uh, a temperature decrease when we apply a magnetic field. And in the case of the inverse magnetocaloric effect, um, in contrast to the conventional magnetocaloric effect, the low temperature magnetization is lower than the high temperature magnetization. So since the field is going to stabilize the high magnetization state, it is going to reduce the Curie temperature this time. Okay, the Curie temperature or the transition temperature of whatever kind it may be uh, is going to go down. So when you apply a magnetic field, the transition temperature was here, so it has to go down here. These have shifted downward, and this whole blue curve, now black, has shifted leftwards. So 
Now that we've constructed the entropy curves, let's see what happens to our um, temperature. So if the initial temperature is here, if we're sitting um, in this state and we apply a magnetic field um, adiabatically, this is going to go to this point over here. So we have a cooling. Okay? So it's going to go from this state on this curve, and then um, it will go down to the to a point um, on the uh, on the hysteresis on the curve of h um, greater than zero, of course. Now these are okay, but to exactly which points do we go to? Okay, this is a temperature j. This is also a temperature change. We're here on the forward transformation path, and when this temperature changes, do we go to the forward transformation path or the reverse transformation path? And where do we go when we have a hysteresis? Yeah. Now, uh, I want to show you this uh, uh, animation just once more to see all the individual uh, effects. We'll go through that a little bit slower. What we have here, is our hysteresis temperature temperature versus uh, sorry <clears throat> entropy versus temperature and this is our hysteresis under h equals zero the state of the entropy that is the state of the system is here at one and when we're applying magnetic field this curve is going to shift around but this point has to remain on this line, because it's an adiabatic process. It cannot move up and down. It has to remain on that line. But the curve will move up and down so that the point, with respect to the curve, will be moving up and down, but not with respect to the entropy. So now we apply a magnetic field. The point has remained on that line. It's gone to point two. Um, since, OK, the field is greater than 0 now, so the entropy curve has shifted downwards. And we have gone from a state relative to this line over here. This is pure martensite, this is pure austenite, let's say. Of course, in reality, these are not steep. Otherwise, you would have on and off. I mean, these are kind of slanted and things, but just to show you. So we've moved from this point to this point over here. So we've changed the state of the system. And since we've changed the state of the system, we've gone from T1 to T2, OK? And where have we come? We were on the forward transformation path here. We're still on the forward transformation path, first of all. But we haven't completed um, the, uh, okay, we've gone from one to the, uh, now, when we, um, uh, when we now remove the magnetic field, so this was the initial application of the magnetic field, the full, the full five Tesla or whatever we have. So now if we want to remove the magnetic field, this point, to be able to change the state of the system, has to land somehow on this path. If it remains on this path, then nothing will happen. The state of the system will not change unless you're on the proper path. Okay. So now we're applying a magnetic field and the whole uh, curve is shifting upwards. And as you can see here, um, we were at point two. Nothing happened. When, uh, in between, when we were going from here to here, the state of the system did not change. So what do we have there? We have uh, a caloric effect, which is associated with a system where the state is not changing when we're removing the magnetic field. So in this very little area here, we have the conventional magnetocaloric effect. So remo remo removing a field from such a system causes further cooling. So the temperature has gone from T2 to T2, T3, although we have removed the field, yeah? In the pure, if we never had hysteresis or anything like that, by applying and removing magnetic fields on an inverse magnetocaloric system, then you'd always be on the proper path and you would uh, be uh, warming and cooling without having to go through any hysteresis. So, and then um, we remove the field further. 
when we're removing the field further, the, uh, the, the sole entropy uh, curve is going to shift to the right and up. So this, now the state has a chance of changing. That is, along that path, and as you can see, it's gone all the way down to here. And the temperature change is now from a T3 to T4, which is, of course, less than the temperature change that we had uh, in, the, in the beginning. <clears throat> so, and then if we want to go and further apply a magnetic field, then the whole process continues. Uh, the state goes to the right, and then it goes to T2, and then to T3, and then back to T4. And we get stuck between T3 and T4, okay? And this is T1 and T2. I tried to make a video of this, holding my, um, my telephone, but it was a little bit shaky. I wanted to put that immediately. Maybe we can do that this afternoon so you can have all access to it. Um, if we can, if somebody can hold the camera still, <laughs> things will upload it and then, so you can play around with this, okay? Um, I'll also, well, I'm going to give everybody the, uh, the PowerPoint uh, files as well so you can play around with this and you'll know the, what is going on. So this is basically, um, this is the case of a magnetic field. You can think of this in terms of, um, uh, instead of a magnetic field, you can think of in terms of pressure, um, stress, wherever you have a, uh, a field-induced transformation or field of any, any kind. You can construct this um, uh, for the conventional magnetocaloric effect. If you're interested in it, maybe you can do it yourself and then upload it into YouTube. Um, these uh, Francisca, my PhD, Atakan, he was also my PhD student. They got together and it took us about to, to refine this uh, thing. It took us a quite a long time. We had several versions of this until we came up with a version that could be uh, under, understandable. Some was too complicated. We didn't understand it and things, but this sort of gives you an overview of what the hysteresis kind of looks like. Okay. So, now, first shots, second shots, and so on. When you go into the literature, you'll find um, lots of populism, okay, concerning this, especially when it comes to the, uh, uh, the size of the magnetocaloric effect, okay? People show their best. They always show first shots. They never show second shots. And um, they're meaningful still to a certain extent, of course. If disregarding the hysteresis, you come across um, collections of materials uh, that have been studied, uh, what the adiabatic temperature is, um, and in which temperature range uh, everything seems to be working. So, as you can see here, um, the, uh, the original prototype material was gadolinium. It sits somewhere around here. It's, it's quite high. And uh, people have built refrigerators with using gadolinium. Uh, and um, gadolinium is a second-order transition systems, uh, which I will be uh, disproving a little later. But still, I mean, let's just call it second order for the moment. And... Uh, uh, so, uh, hysteresis is very little or non-existing, uh, so that everything is reversible and we do not have to worry about hysteresis losses. But gadolinium seems to be the only material uh, that shows this hysteresis-less property and a large magnetocaloric effect around a second order transition. Gadolinium has a very large magnetic moment of seven Bohr magnetons or something, so uh, the magnetocaloric effect in gadolinium, uh, the size lives from the size of the magnetization, yeah? So you need, um, if you have a sizable magnetization, then that's one condition to have a sizable magnetocaloric effect. Then uh, there are many other materials. Um, this one in particular has a quite a narrow hysteresis, uh, and the, let me see, uh, this is lanthanum iron silicon, so doped with hydrogen. Um, these 
are also interesting, but they contain gadolinium, and gadolinium is expensive. It's very expensive. So you want something without gadolinium. There are systems. Um, this one, the manganese iron phosphorus systems are also widely studied, and at the moment, I think it's these two which are being more used as prototypes for building um, refrigerators. So, um, so much for the magnetocaloric effect in Hoistlers and these systems. Now, um, uh, we're still talking about hysteresis and um, which compounds are favorable. Um, I will show you those. And um, maybe we can also try to see how we can narrow hysteresis, what are some causes of hysteresis, and um, are hysteresis effects somehow related to the kind of magnetic orderings that we have. It's kind of speculative, but I'd like to show you the data. So the next uh, uh, material that I would like to show you is what has also worked in this group a lot, is the, uh, the antiperovskite, the manganese 3 gallium carbon. Okay, so that's a basically an FCC system. It has a carbon sitting in the middle and uh, some manganese on the, uh, on, on the face centers. Uh, and uh, so this is a, uh, uh, a typical material showing some interesting things featuring manganese, which uh, I will talk to you about on, uh, most probably on Thursday and Friday. Uh, concerning the, uh, the magnetism of manganese and, and iron. But anyhow, right now, uh, I'll show you the, uh, uh, the temperature dependence of the magnetization measured in various fields here. So as you can see here, uh, more, uh, if you can visualize this more or less on the same scale as the prototypes that I have given you for nickel manganese indium and nickel manganese tin, where we called a narrow hysteresis, something like 14 Kelvin, and a broad hysteresis somewhere around 30 Kelvin, you see here that the hysteresis associated with any transition is much narrower. Now, in this system, you have a transition from an antiferromagnetic state to a ferromagnetic state. This state is cubic. This state is also cubic. The cube in the ferromagnetic state is a little smaller than the cube in the antiferromagnetic state. It's, a, it, it's a, an anomaly. Normally, you would expect a volume decrease with decreasing temperature. But here, in this case, the high temperature state has a smaller volume than the low temperature state. And that is due to the increase of the magnetic moment in the antiferromagnetic state. How that increases, uh, uh, we'll... Uh, I'll try to show you that uh, later on when we're discussing manganese alone. So um, we have a transition temperature from the antiferromagnetic to the ferromagnetic state. It's at about uh, 167 Kelvin. And then we have a transition from the ferromagnetic state to the paramagnetic state at about 250 Kelvin. Now, the nice thing about this is that uh, you have a cube here, and you know what an antiferromagnet is. You can make an antiferromagnet in this cube. Now, in the, in the hoisters, we had similar data, right? We had a martensitic transition. We go from one state to another state. Um, of course, the structure changes. But we can't construct our antiferromagnetism. It's uh, so that we have other kinds of antiferromagnetisms there, which are... Um, short-range or glass-like antiferromagnetism. Um, but here, we can really identify the antiferromagnetism. So, um, if we look at the field dependence of the magnetization sitting at about 150 Kelvin over here, what we observe is a 
um, <clears throat> is a field-induced transformation from an antiferromagnetic state to a ferromagnetic state, up and down. There's a certain amount of hysteresis involved here, and this corresponds to the hysteresis that we have in the temperature dependence of the magnetization. Now, how do you, how do you relate these hysteresis? Maybe we can try that. I haven't done that yet. But it is true that the width of this hysteresis, when you think of it in terms of energy, uh, when you think of it in terms of the Zeeman energy, just the magnetization times the, uh, the magnetic field, that should be more or less the same as we have in the thermal hysteresis. I mean, the hysteresis is hysteresis, yeah? Here we can show it on a wider scale, maybe. But uh, this uh, width of the hysteresis in terms of energy should be equal to the width of the hysteresis, again, in terms of energy over here as well. We have a certain amount of hysteresis. Thermally, it's easy to measure. Okay, so the magnetic field is like this. So if we go up here and back down here, uh, we have to go through a hysteresis um, in order to um, have a reversibility in the magnetocaloric effect. These are, in this sense, uh, much more nicer than the Oyster systems. Um, if we do the same kind of an experiment that we did uh, for the nickel manganese indium hoister, remember that the, uh, um, the, when we um, take our system to a low temperature uh, where it is purely in the antiferromagnetic state and we then go to a, the, uh, the measuring temperature, we apply a magnetic field Let's say when we're over here, uh, we get a certain temperature change, and then we remove the magnetic field, we get another temperature change. So increasing and decreasing the field gives you pretty much the same temperature change. Not exactly, uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's quite reversible. And if we do this experiment like we've done for the Hoistlers, um, uh, the, um, the, the uh, repetition, a cyclic uh, field change experiment, then we get this step-like feature. You see here we have a, the initial shot is 3.1 and subsequent shots are 2.8. So this is not bad at all, okay? Um, this would be an ideal uh, system to use if the transition temperature were at room temperature <laughs> for, for room temperature cooling. Uh, but uh, it's still a good system if you're not thinking of room temperature cooling and if you're thinking of some kind of low temperature um, application like uh, space, blood preser preservation, tissue preservation, uh, or if you want to a refrigerator for some purpose that will um, uh, operate in that range, then it becomes uh, important. Um, it can be important for pre-cooling gas liquefaction, um, of course, if you have to vary the operating temperature range, but there are also low temperature applications for such purposes. If you go to proper temperatures, um, you can, uh, it, it's thought for uh, keeping uh, cryogenic liquids at low temperature, uh, maintaining, uh, in, maintaining them in the liquid state and so on. Anyhow, um, there are ways of bringing this temperature upwards. And <clears throat> one way of doing that is to try to play around with the composition here. You can do many things. Uh, you can change the carbon concentration. You can change the uh, manganese composition and whatnot. They'll move around and things. So you lose the features. You, uh, you may be... Um, the, uh, the transition temperature will shift, but the magnetocaloric effect will also decrease. Um, so the best way that we uh, sort of encountered of shifting these around was to replace carbon with some nitrogen. If you replace carbon with a little bit of nitrogen, then what you get is something like this. You get a very sharp peak. And the funny thing is here, you, the low, st the, 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 the low temperature state is still antiferromagnetic, but what happens to the high temperature phase? The high temperature phase, it 
practically loses its uh, ferromagnetism. So it's no longer, um, there is no longer long range ferromagnetic ordering. It's very strongly paramagnetic. So it's something like an enhanced paramagnet. Okay, it's, it almost orders, but it doesn't order. There is no ordering. There is no plateau over here, o over here, as we do over here. So we have a new state. And we have a transition from an uh, anti-ferromagnetic state to an almost ferromagnetic state. Now, what does that mean? So to understand that, if you, uh, if you look at the field dependence of the magnetization of these systems, what you find is, again, you have field-induced transformations here. So you increase the field. Let's look at this 175. You increase the field. You come to a point. Um, where you have a, start having a transition from the anti-ferromagnetic state to the ferromagnetic state. You have some background here. You have some background ferromagnetism at low temperature, but that's not important here. So you have a transition from an anti-ferromagnetic state to something that does not saturate. It just keeps on increasing and increasing. Okay? Normally, I mean, this should run flat when you're in a pure ferromagnetic state. So... Um, Good. Since we have a transition from one state to another state, this would mean that we should be having an entropy change. And indeed we do. We have an entropy change. We have the inverse magnetocaloric effect when we go from the antiferromagnetic state to this enhanced paramagnetic state, and it just seems to be increasing and increasing. And then uh, when we're out here, then we have the negative entropy change, meaning that we have the conventional uh, magnetocaloric effect. <clears throat> so, um, we've lost the hysteresis, okay? So this, is, this, this system, when nothing else, is, tells us that when we have lost the long-range magnetic ordering, we've also lost the hysteresis. Here, look at this curve. This is taken at 175 Kelvin. It's somewhere around here. You increase and you decrease and you're on the same curve. So you can lose hysteresis. Well, this was surprising. If you lose hysteresis, that's great. That's a wonderful magnetocaloric material. And the operating temperature has gone up, up, up to about 200 Kelvin. And if you look at the changes, you, if you apply and remove a magnetic field, particularly at any temperature, you get the same thing back. And if you do this on a series of steps, what do you find? Nothing, the initial shot and the final shot, they're all the same. Okay? So what have we done? We've lost this teresis. Now this brings the question, which is an unanswered question at the moment. Um, in magnetic systems, we, at magnetostructural transitions, we have a certain amount of hysteresis. In um, systems where we go from a ferromagnet to an antiferromagnet, it seems that, okay, we still have a hysteresis. It's narrowed down to a certain extent in manganese-3 gallium carbon. But when we put nitrogen in there, it has disappeared completely. Now, does this have anything to do with the disappearance of ferromagnetism? So what does ferromagnetism bring us in addition um, to what we already have uh, at the magnetostructural transition? We have strains at the magnetostructural transition due to the mismatch of the crystallographic structures, okay? But in addition to that, we have ferromagnetic domains when we have a ferromagnet to an antiferromagnetic transition. And these domains, moving them around, they also cost energy, it seems. Now, when we've lost the ferromagnetism, it appears that we, have, we, we don't have to worry about the energy 
um, uh, that, 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 uh, that, that is necessary to move around these ferromagnetic domains because we don't have the domains anymore to worry about. The only thing that we have to worry about is the volume difference, if there's a volume difference. And it turns out that the volume difference also starts disappearing in the case when we start adding nitrogen to these systems. So the hysteresis has narrowed down, mainly perhaps for two reasons. One is the, uh, the, uh, the redu re reduce of mechanical strains because there doesn't seem to be any volume change. And the second is due to the absence of ferromagnetic domains over there. Now, how can we further understand? This is one system. I mean, we can't conclude that, okay, absence of ferromagnetic domains, no hysteresis. This is one th system that suggests that, though it doesn't prove it. Are there any other systems that perhaps show us similar effects? In fact, there are. I want to show you one more system before we take a break, and these are the so-called nictides, if you want to call them like that. They are manganese-2 antimony base systems, uh, manganese chromium antimony, and in this case it's manganese chromium antimony indium. So manganese chromium antimony is a system, or manganese antimony is a system that is that appears to be um, a tet has a tetragonal uh, unit cell, and we have manganese one sites and manganese two sites. So these are the manganese one, and these are manganese two. They are two different sites with two different magnetic moments, and we have the antimony. Uh, we have a transition, uh, which is the spin re reorientation transition, where we have a transition from ferrimagnetism to antiferromagnetism. Now here we're not worrying about ferromagnetism, okay? We have a transition from a ferrimagnet to an antiferromagnet. And this is what the temperature dependence of the magnetization looks like when you change the composition. This is pure manganese to antimony. It does something like this. And then when you um, add chromium to this, and then indium, which suppresses uh, the ferromagnetic background, uh, then you have a series of curves that um, look like this as the chromium composition increases. So this is very nice as an example that shows you how you shift your transition temperature and the uh, working point of the magnetocaloric effect from one temperature to higher temperatures. This system has an envelope curve. So the, um, the Curie temperature of the Ferry magnetic phase doesn't seem to change. It's all one. But the transformation from the Ferry magnet to the, anti, uh, to the antiferromagnetic change, uh, state, it changes. And what else do you see? You see that you have practically no hysteresis, or very, very, very small hysteresis when you go from a ferromagnet to an antiferromagnet. And if you look at your magneto calorics, then what you see here is when you, this is the field dependence of the magnetization. If you look at this curve, this is going up and this is going down. It's almost like the case in the antiperovskite with nitrogen. There, it almost retraces its, uh, the curves back and forth. If you measure the temperature change, increasing and decreasing magnetic field, it makes no difference. If you come here and look at the first and subsequent shots, they're all the same. This is just the profile of the magnetic field versus the things. We don't have to go into that. But uh, what do we have here? Again we have a system which is non-ferromagnetic. It's transforming to uh, the anti-ferromagnetic state. We have a magnetostructural transition. And we, 
encounter here also the case of a system that is narrow his that has a narrow hysteresis and is not ferromagnetic at the same time. So it appears that ferromagnetism seems to be an unfavorable um, state to have uh, when you're looking for a narrow hysteresis at a magnetostructural transition. Now, do we have domains here also? We have, yes, okay, we have a Ferry magnet. Um, we do also have domains in a Ferry magnet, but the domains are, weakly, uh, are weaker pinned than in the case of a ferromagnet, yeah? Uh, when you're... Um, uh, uh, when, you, when you're considering, because you have in a ferry magnet, you have a, uh, a sublattice which has a s certain spin in one direction, and looking in the other direction, it's like an antiferromagnet, but with another spin. And these do form, to a certain extent, domains. If you had a perfect antiferromagnet, you wouldn't have domains. If you have a small imbalance, you'd start having domains. But the domains, the pinning of the domains, are first weak, and as you gradually go into the ferromagnetic configuration, then you have stronger pinning. So, um, it seems that magnetocaloric effects and uh, ferromagnetism, or magnetic configurations, uh, they seem to go in hand in hand uh, through, the, uh, um, through the domain walls, the magnetic domain walls that have been built. So, if we can avoid ferromagnetism, we may have a chance of narrowing so we are at this stage right now um, of uh, uh, developing materials, let's say. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't have them here, but there are several other materials. If we add, for example, to this manganese chromium antimony system, if we put in a little bit of cobalt, we take everything to room temperature, and we have some very nice material there as well. So, uh, I think um, we can give a break now. Uh, in the next section, I want to talk about some orders of transitions and things. Um, then, uh, are there any questions? I'll wait for all of you to wake up before you think of whatever questions you want to ask. Are things clear to a certain extent? Okay, I'll ask. Well, what, what is clear? <laughs> okay, we'll talk about that in the break then. So, um, I was asked a few questions outside, and uh, uh, quite interesting ones. I haven't shown you anything related to technological applications. Maybe I'll bring in that tomorrow a little bit. I'll show you how these things um, are used. Um, how they're constructed and so. Um, as you may realize, uh, we're talking about materials, uh, we're talking about temperature changes, and all these materials usually have a temperature change in the order of 2-3 uh, Kelvin or something, um, but 2-3 Kelvin is not enough for refrigeration. So what do you do? You take your material, you change its composition a little bit, you change the structural transition, the magnetostructural transition temperature, Take another one. So you can do this. I'll show you these uh, on graphs tomorrow, actually. So what you have is you have a range of materials which have different transition temperatures. And then you form a composite. Let's say you have a transition temperature change uh, range from something like 250 Kelvin to 350 Kelvin. So you're covering your range of 100 Kelvin. So what you do is uh, when you start cooling, uh, one material is active, and then uh, as you cool it down, this, the other material and the other material, they get consecutively active, and you have a range of temperatures where we, you can use these magnetocaloric materials. This is done in the case of lanthanum iron silicon, when you add hydrogen with different compositions, I think it's, yeah, you add hydrogen with different compositions, you can vary the transition temperature. In the case of iron phosphorus, uh, iron manganese phosphorus silicon, then you can switch around the manganese and the phosphorus concentration. I don't know at the moment, but anyhow, it is also possible with those materials to cover a certain range. I think of about 30 Kelvin or something like that. 
which is uh, quite convenient. Uh, the, uh, if you're thinking of air conditioning, for example, I mean, cooling is not only refrigerator, uh, but it's also air conditioning. If the outside temperature is 35 degrees, and what do you want? You want 25 degrees, 26 degrees. So uh, it's a good range where things like that uh, would work. Now, <clears throat> gadolinium is a wonder material. You know, we always have wonder materials. Nickel titanium for the shape memory effect. Nickel manganese gallium uh, for the magnetic shape memory effect. And we have gallium for the magnetocaloric effect because gallium covers the whole range all by itself. So you don't need composite materials, but it's so expensive. Um, and for some reason or another, all these wonder materials, they come in one by one. You never get a second one, yeah? Um, uh, nickel titanium is a wonderful shape memory alloy. You have modifications of nickel titanium with nickel titanium copper, nickel titanium iron and whatnot to improve the properties, but you never get something, another one parallel to that, which is equally good. Neither the case with nickel manganese gallium. You have field induced uh, twin boundary motion and things, but uh, nobody's ever found a second one. Yeah? And nobody's ever found a second gadolinium. So uh, this is an interesting trick of nature, perhaps. We don't know. <laughs> Anyhow. So now uh, I want to get to a more philosophical point right now in this lecture, just to clarify a few things about first order transitions and second order transitions. OK? Now we always talk about first order transitions and second order transitions. And um, in theory, uh, it's all possible. In experiment, uh, things are not as they seem to be, okay? So um, let's look at order of transition from a purely experimental point of view, okay? Uh, we learn in lectures um, about um, thermodynamics, first order transitions, second order transitions, uh, air and fest relations, um, the first order transition, is, uh, shows a discontinuity um, in the first derivative of the free energy and the second order transition shows a discontinuity in the second derivative. Um, all these very strict things, yeah? But in, uh, in nature, nothing ever really comes close to that. Um, it seems that the first order transition works pretty well, okay? The first order transition, we have a latent heat at the transformation temperature. And yeah, if you're thinking of derivatives, first order is also um, discontinu discontinuous. So let's uh, look at the conventional wording over here. We say for a first order transition, latent heat pre pre present, this can be in a solid solid or a solid liquid transformation, it's a martensitic transformation, or just uh, water and ice. Yeah, we have, a, uh, we have latent heat. That goes into breaking bonds and creating the new structure or forming bonds. In a second order transition, we say we have no latent heat. This is the magnetic transition, it's the paramagnetic, ferromagnetic transition. Now, what do we have here? Back to our shape memory. This is uh, nickel titanium. We have a first order transition. This is the specific heat as a function of temperature. The area under this is the, is the enthalpy, yeah, in general. But we call it latent heat for some reason or another. Because we call it latent heat because it's close to the transition. I mean, latent heat is nothing but the enthalpy in general. So this is the Martensitic transition, and this is, we cal calculate the area under this curve and we get the enthalpy. Now, let's look at um, magnetic transitions. Now, in a second order transition, but do we say there's no latent heat? Well, let's start with chromium. We measure the specific heat, and we get this huge peak. So it's a magnetic transition, second order, okay, but we have this huge peak at the transition. So what is this, what is this huge peak? 
Now we look at two things over here. We look at the specific heat, endothermal expansion. They're related to one another through a so-called Grüneisen parameter. If you take the ratio of the specific heat to the thermal expansion, then you get a value uh, which uh, should uh, um, give you an idea of um, what the uh, what the transition what the constants of the transition properties are, okay? It should be more or less constant. Anyhow, when we look at the thermal expansion, this is the thermal expansion coefficient. If you look at the thermal expansion coefficient, um, there is a tremendous change at the nail temperature. Now the nail temperature of chromium is about 300, uh, 311, 312 degrees. It's a right around room temperature. So we have this large anomaly in the specific heat, and then we have this large anomaly in the thermal expansion. Now immediately, if you see a large anomaly in the thermal expansion, what are you measuring? You're measuring length change. Um, you're measuring volume change, if you think of the system as being isotropic. Well, if there's so large volume changes and things like that going on, these are no longer magnetic transitions. They're magnetostructural transitions, all of them. They have to be. So this is not new, actually. In the late 1950s, uh, people have um, come up with these ideas that, um, I think one was Callan and Callan, this is paper, uh, where they, you, you always encounter a magnetostructural coupling at the so-called close to the magneto, um, uh, magneto uh, close to the magnetic transition. So now let's look at some other examples. <clears throat> this is a material, strontium iron arsenide, and what you see here is a little bit more clear. It's, uh, it's more clear in the sense that it gives you a more better temperature range where all these things are happening. If you look at the saturation magnetization, this thing uh, shows you a drop in the magnetization as you increase the temperature. But then the magnetization suddenly drops. It drops immediately. If you look at the specific heat, you find a structural transition. It looks first order, and you have some kind of an enthalpy or some kind of a latent heat at the transition. So here you see that although the transition progresses in the form of a second order transition, that is, what is your order parameter? It's the magnetization of the magnetic moments are slowly decoupling. And if there were, if this transition had not taken place, then the Curie temperature of this would have been somewhere around here instead of being here. So this is then not a Curie temperature in that sense. It's a magnetostructural transition. If I were to apply a very large magnetic field, um, it would be possible to stabilize this state all the way up to here, perhaps. In any system, if you find a large shift of a transition temperature, a so-called Curie-like temperature, with a magnetic field, then that cannot be a purely ferromagnetic transition. Because the magnetic field will shift your transition temperature according to the Clausius Clapeyron by a very small amount. Magnetic field is no energy. You can't even do this with pressure. Yeah, it's almost impossible. So if you are at a pure second order state or close to a pure or second order state, you will see that neither the pressure nor an external magnetic field is capable of really shifting your transition temperature. Five tesla is nothing, it's not a magnetic field, okay? 10 tesla is also nothing in this sense. If you measure magnetization curves as a function of magnetic field, you'll find that your Curie temperature always remains the same. Let me show you that over here. I, th uh, I think this is a pretty good example over here. You see here that the 
transition temperature, or the, um, uh, the, the, the magnetization is measured in, uh, first in a very small field, and then at one tesla, three tesla, and five tesla. Now, when you measure it in a small field, you can detect uh, very simply uh, what the Curie temperature may be. Whether this is a true Curie temperature or not, that we don't know either. We don't know whether there's any structure involved here, but still, structural change. Now, look at these curves taken in one, three, and five Tesla. This Curie temperature over here, if you choose the inflection point of these curves as the Curie temperature, it's remained constant almost. There's practically no change in the Curie temperature. But look here. There's this tremendous change in the Curie temperature. It shifts by about, uh, I don't know, four degrees. Ah, it's four, it's, it's four Kelvin per Tesla. So in five Tesla, it's shifted about 20 degrees already. Yeah? So these magnetostructural transitions shift. Uh, the first order magnetostructural transitions shift. You can really see this. You'll find magnetic fields shifting transition temperatures. The applied magnetic field is not much in energy. But what does that mean? The small energies that you provide to the system couple to the structure, and they can change the structural transition temperatures because these structures are very delicate, okay? They require not that much energy. But changing a Curie temperature here at these things means changing the electronic structure of the system, and that you can't do. You have to change the whole um, um, electronic structure of the system. You have, the, you, have, you have a new density of states picture and things. So we have the case of, of chromium here. Now, uh, and, and this again. And now let's look at something more conventional. Let's look at iron. Iron shows some kind of a magnetization that looks like this. And we say we have a Curie temperature over here. And then if you measure the susceptibility with the right scale, uh, shown with the right scale here, then you have the region of BCC iron, FCC iron, then you have the second BCC iron, and then you have the liquid state. So you can measure these magnetizations, and you see all these changes around here, okay? So now, what is this doing? We look at the specific heat of iron. If we consider only BCC iron and um, we kind of uh, uh, estimate what the specific heat of BCC iron would be in the high temperature range if it were stable, then we get um, a specific heat curve that looks more like this. This looks something um, close to the Curie temperature. And then uh, this is the um, specific heat under constant volume. Uh, sorry, this is the specific heat under constant volume. Uh, this is the lattice specific heat. And then you have some contributions over here, electronic and harmonic. And then we have something here called magnetic. And is that magnetic? And if we look at um, gadolinium, this wonder material, you have this peak, you have this specific heat, and you have, if you want to, um, extract the rest of the specific heat from the lattice specific heat, you draw a line something like this using some kind of a Debye formulation or something. And then you have this huge area over here. Area means enthalpy. So what is all this enthalpy? Okay, you have that. So it's not just at the magnetic stru structural transition that you are seeing these um, latent heat-like things. It's way further beyond. Now, these are the specific heats. Now, um, the question is, when we see these anomalies in the, specific heat, uh, in the specific heats of all these conventional materials, then what are they related to? Now, experimentally, you, theoretically, you can say anything you want. But experimentally, then you would go and measure the thermal expansion. The thermal expansion gives you a very sensitive way of measuring very, very small changes in the volume. But you cannot see in very many cases with simple x-rays. People do see some changes with x-rays also only with uh, in synchrotron radiation sources and things. So looking at iron and nickel, oh, what's happening here? So you have nickel here and iron here, and this is a th 
uh, temperature dependence of the thermal expansion. You have a peak in this direction in nickel, and you have a peak in this direction in iron. Okay? Now, uh, I'll just tell you, you can think about it. Um, if you would be coming um, with decreasing temperature, you find that in iron, the thermal expansion coefficient starts to decrease. If the thermal expansion coefficient is decreasing, then the volume is changing less. Okay? So here, in this area over here, you have a volume increase in iron. So when it goes through the so-called Curie temperature, which should be over here, it actually undergoes a volume increase. So if it's undergoing a volume increase, it's not the same system anymore. So this is why it is not possible from an experimental point of view to have a second order transition that is complete at the Curie temperature. When you approach the Curie temperature, it is interrupted with some kind of a first order effect, which you have over here. And then you can understand this. In nickel, it's the opposite case. So in nickel, you come down in the temperature. It, the volume gets smaller and smaller. And suddenly, the thermal expansion coefficient increases at the Curie temperature. It increases. It gets smaller faster. Okay, in iron, it gets smaller slower. In nickel, it gets smaller faster. So there's also a magnetostructural transition in nickel as well. <clears throat> so um, the reason why it happens in different directions is that um, iron is BCC. The uh, easy axis of magnetization is in the one zero zero direction. So you will have an anisotropy when you think of a cube and, um, and then you go through a transition and you have magnetic ordering, you have extra forces in there. So there's no reason why it should remain as a cube. What can it do? It can perhaps stretch in one direction or contract in one direction, expand in the other direction. And this direction in this case is the one zero zero direction, okay? So if it contracts in one direction, the other direction, you have extra forces due to the magnetic ordering and the volume expands, okay, when you're decreasing in temperature. In the case of nickel, you have um, the easy axis of magnetization is the one, one, one. So it appears that if you have an anisotropy in the one, one, one direction, then if you think of a cube and if you pull it in the corners, you'll have a parallel distortion. You'll have a monoclinic distortion, which can cause, um, in this case, a shrinkage in the volume. So it's the magnetoelastic, it's, it's the, um, uh, this is the magneto uh, crystalline anisotropy in which direction you're looking that can either cause a volume change or a volume increase. Now let's come to our wonder material of gadolinium. This looks like iron, except it's huge. It's huge. It's immense. The, um, the anomaly in the thermal expansion. So where is our uh, second order transition? It seems that there is no pure second order transition, okay? Now, theories will still work. It doesn't matter. They'll work up to the second order transition. But if you start measuring critical exponents and trying to fit the theories and things like that, well, certain questions arise as what have been people been measuring as critical exponents uh, at uh, temperatures close to Curie temperatures? And with which theory are you fitting? Because you're measuring something at a first order magnetostructural transition and the theory is made for a second order transition, well, things are vague. So um, be careful in the future when you're talking about first and second order transitions. Um, it's okay, I mean, theoretically, it gives you an idea, it gives you a view, but just exactly what you're measuring, um, just give it a second thought, okay? So, and this goes on and on. 
Now, very recently, in fact, in 2008 or something, uh, there was a new paper published reconsidering all of this. And indeed, um, they have gone and measured the resistance at high temperature of nickel, iron, cobalt, and as a reference material, some cobalt oxide uh, material. And in all cases, within experimental resolution, they find that there is always hysteresis involved with these transitions. You never get away with it. And if you look at some uh, calorimetric measurements, some differential calorimetric measurements, um, you measure on increasing temperature the heat flow, and you find that the peak in your heat flow is not at the same position when you're going up and down in temperature. That's like measuring the specific heat on increasing temperature and decreasing temperature. You're not on the same peak. The peaks are shifted. And also in the case of iron, it's more um, clear. Cobalt also, and here also. So this is the story of the magnetostructural transition and the uh, various hysteresis involved in all of these things. Now, I come to a point where I will start on something new. This is all I have to say for the moment. I will bring in some other uh, things next week concerning, uh, next week, oh my God, <laughs> tomorrow, <laughs> concerning the uh, uh, various application aspects of magnetocaloric effects um, concerning materials and how to select materials and so on. Now, um, what I would like to do is to start introducing um, um, you to modulated structures. We go into a little bit more details in these martensitic transitions and uh, how we deal with modulated structures and phase diagrams and so on. So this will be uh, first, as of today, it will be more inter introductory. So I'll, um, what I would like to do with you tomorrow, if possible, get a hold of Jana. Okay? We'll do some examples here as well, if you haven't already. Or if you don't have computers, you can share them and we'll, uh, we'll go into examples. Uh, what I want to do over here right now is go into the, uh, another part of these lectures, and that, into, that involves intermartensitic transitions. Now, we've talked about martensitic transitions in a lot of these systems. And then we come to a point uh, where we look at the temperature dependence of um, the transition, the transition parameters, and so on. And we see that the uh, phases that stabilize below a certain Martensitic transition um, transform within themselves to various kinds of structures. And these are called intermartensitic transitions. Now, um, just to introduce you to this concept, we have here the, uh, a, th this is basically a lecture that is, uh, that was prepared by my uh, colleague, um, which I tried to modify it to, for the purposes of these lectures. Uh, so we have, uh, okay, we have problems with colors, okay. So we have the uh, our austenite structure that's near room temperature, and then we have the martensite structure. And we extract from that the, we visualize the tetragonal state from that structure. Now, there is a subtlety in the martensitic state. So when we go into the martensitic state, 
from the austenite state, what happens? We have a cubic state, first in the austenite state, and then we go into a, let's say, tetragonal state. And the tetragon can have various orientation, 